Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I want to say that uh, I'm very pleased and honored to have a chance to speak to you today. Uh, I'm very uh, sorry to hear uh, about more air raid sirens, we call them, uh, that are going off in Ukraine today. Uh, it's terrible what's going on, and I'm very happy to tell you a little bit about single molecules and actually my life in science. Uh, tell you how these single molecules led to the Nobel Prize and how you can use them to see the nanoscale. So, uh, Dimitro, please uh, confirm that everything looks and sounds okay. One second. One, one second, please. Looks okay? Yeah, everything is fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm going to start with a concept uh, that I'd like to clarify, uh, the idea of what we call resolution and the nanoscale. Uh, there are many different spatial scales of interest in science, uh, especially in biology. I'm only showing a few orders of magnitude here, but resolution really means uh, the minimum distance at which you can distinguish two objects that might be close together. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But uh, in the arena of biology, there are uh, at the 10 to 100 micron scale uh, are entire cells, then bacteria, down below that viruses, below that proteins, and uh, down in the one nanometer range are individual small molecules. Uh, if you would like to observe these features, you can imagine using different types of microscopy. There are a number of microscopy methods that can uh, show some detail down at the very, very uh, smallest times spatial scales, but these are hard to use with live cells and it's hard to see specific proteins when many others are around. On the other hand, light microscopy, uh, just using visible light uh, is quite non-invasive, doesn't destroy the samples like electron beams actually do, uh, and you can specifically label sp certain biomolecules, individual biomolecules of a certain type. So this works typically and conventionally down to the few hundred nanometer scale. And that's because this uh, particular scale is the optical diffraction limit. Uh, we'll talk about this more in a few moments, but basically when you use light, you cannot resolve things uh, in a simple way that are closer than about 250 to 300 nanometers. So you cannot see fine detail. Uh, on the other hand, super resolution microscopy is, is a new advance uh, that uh, has appeared in the last few decades that allows you to use light to go beyond this barrier and to see detail down into the nanoscale, into the nanometer range, 10 to the minus nine meters. So we're gonna talk about how that works today. Uh, but before we talk about that, let me just admit, since you've seen, you've seen the title of my, of my talk today, uh, we're gonna use single molecules. We study optically individual molecules. Unfo you know, however, you all may have also heard about this famous scientist, uh, physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, who uh, is one of the founders of quantum mechanics, a brilliant scientist in the early 1920s. He said in 1952, the year before I was born, we never experiment with just one electron or atom or small molecule. In thought experiments, maybe we do. It somehow can be ridiculous. Maybe we're not really experimenting with them any more than we can raise ichthyosauria in the zoo, uh, as a particular dinosaur in the zoo. So this is one of my first messages to you today. I'm going to give you several important signposts. The signpost here is number one. Beware when Nobel laureates say something cannot be done. <laughs> so uh, in fact, when this happens, it's often a, a challenge to other scientists to say, okay, we're going to prove that Nobel laureate is wrong. And uh, in, in fact, Nobel laureates can be wrong. Uh, I can be wrong and have been. So uh, that's the first thing I'd like for you to remember today. But let's go back to my early days as a young scientist and ham uh, radio operator and so on. Uh, I don't want to give you a little flavor about this because it, what I'm really trying to communicate is that I'm a regular person like, just like you. I went to junior high school in Texas. Uh, here's my eighth grade science fair project on viscosity and motor oils. Uh, I was taking apart old television sets. 
solder burns on the leg, a shock to myself, work, working on the washer and bare feet. Not, not too smart, uh, but various chemistry experiments uh, in the backyard of our house. Uh, in high school, uh, I got my amateur radio license or ham radio license, we call it. Uh, here's uh, one of my stations with receiver and transmitter. Here's another setup uh, and had a lot of fun uh, doing electronics and, and, and played in the band and had many, many clubs. Of course, there, there's a lot of classes. There's a lot of uh, examinations and uh, all, all those sorts of things. But uh, here it's the sort of outside activities I'm mentioning. Uh, I went to college as a Langsdorf engineering fellow at Washington University in St. Louis, started as an electrical engineer but very quickly got turned on by physics and math. Uh, and all three of those, uh, I, I received degrees uh, in all three fields, uh, electrical engineering, physics, and math. Then I went to graduate school in physics at Cornell University, uh, where we studied and used lasers uh, to study molecules and solids, uh, which was a fascinating time uh, through, through all of this education. Uh, I was supported by my parents uh, to have uh, a a comprehensive uh, education, uh, which, which I thank them for very, very much. So uh, now, uh, throughout all of that in my career, uh, I, after uh, college and so on, uh, I went to, after graduate school, getting my PhD uh, there at Cornell, I went to IBM Research, so the uh, research uh, division site in San Jose. And, uh, and uh, these are the years 1981 to 1989, the early steps, because we started moving toward single molecule detection fairly quickly. But why? Why were we interested in single molecules at that time? What was the driving force? We had a research goal to store data in the optical properties of molecules. And the idea in this picture, for example, several of us are using lasers and we're using low temperatures, liquid nitrogen and so on. But the idea was to use the color of the laser for the different bits at low temperatures, a method called spectral hole burning. Uh, this effect occurs in inhomogeneously broadened absorption lines of zero phonon transitions in solids. So this was all out of solid state physics uh, and optical studies, spectroscopy, uh, famous people in those days, uh, Roman Prasanov, Karl Rabani, uh, and a key point, this work at, at this industrial research labs uh, of the 50s to 90s, we could explore new technologies, a new idea for optical storage in this case, but also the underlying th fundamental science. Uh, what sort of questions might limit that idea? Uh, so asking and answering a question beyond the frontier of knowledge was, uh, was encouraged. And I, had a, uh, I really wanted to do that because that was fun and challenging. So the question is, boiled down to uh, a, a level that will be reasonable here, let's think of uh, pentacene molecules. It's got five benzene rings in a paratrophenyl host, and this is uh, transparent. The host is transparent. Pentacene absorbs light, and this turns out to be the absorption spectrum uh, of pentacene uh, at, uh, in the middle of the visible, okay, in this sort of orange range in the visible, or 590 nanometers, or this many wave numbers, or about 500 terahertz. The absorption spectrum uh, of a bunch of uh, pentacene molecules uh, is a narrow absorption line at low temperatures. It looks narrow. Uh, but the question was, is this smooth? Is this uh, spectrum totally smooth? If you imagine uh, sp spreading it out on, at a much, much higher spectral resolution, frequency resolution, and look right at the peak here where spread it out so much that it looks horizontal. Um, what do you see? No one had answered this question at that time. And in 1987, uh, with my postdoc, we took a look at that absorption line and saw this amazing structure. Uh, many, many peaks and valleys. Uh, on this larger scale of, a, of a, a, a roughly a thousand megahertz on a very fine scale of, of few, a few hundred megahertz, uh, there is a rich, interesting, beautiful structure, which turns out to be a statistical effect. It's coming from the number of molecules in resonance. This, this scales as the square root of the number of molecules. So the uh, in, important point here, uh, looking in this new regime, we saw an unexpected effect. Uh, perhaps it seems very uh, sort of esoteric, if you, if you like, 
But at the same time, this led to individual molecules because uh, we did, I realized that if we can see this, which scales as the square root of the number of molecules, then maybe it's not so difficult to get to n equal to one, one molecule in resonance. So we set out to do that in my lab. And uh, in 1989, uh, with Lothar Kador, penicillin and peritrophenol, we observed these absorption lines of single molecules uh, uh, in the crystal. So it turns out that uh, a single absorption line, due to the technique being used, uh, you, you get two copies of it. It's, it's FM spectroscopy being used, and then you take a derivative of that so that you expect a W-shaped structure. And so this W-shaped structure is the absorption of the single molecule. So this opened this door uh, to, uh, to being able to observe single molecules with light. Uh, and, uh, and a year later, Michel Aurie in, in France also used penicillin and paratrophenol and detected single molecules by fluorescence, detecting the light that they emit, uh, which is a, also a, an alter, alternative technique, uh, but it turns out has higher signals noise. And so the field moved to this fluorescence method after this. So in the 1990s, Lots of people were studying these individual molecules and the effects uh, that they might produce and interesting behaviors. What happens at low temperatures? Can you perturb the molecules? Can you make them uh, move to different wavelengths if you put electric fields on and, and things like that? But uh, the, the important point for this part of my talk is to just note that uh, even in this industrial research environment, when you're allowed to explore uh, the fundamentals uh, and the fundamental basic science, then important discoveries uh, can, can occur. Uh, and we took advantage of that. Now, let's step back for a moment, thinking about uh, one molecule. If you can detect one molecule, uh, what does that really mean? So here I'm connecting to a sort of a broader uh, audience and the background of maybe a different students listening today. Uh, so let's get the scale straight. One ounce of water, okay, uh, or a few, a few milliliters of water. Uh, is uh, uh, roughly one mole, one mole of, of water molecules. And it contains, if it's a mole, uh, Avogadro's number of molecules, six times 10 to the 23rd uh, water molecules uh, with many digits. So that's a huge number of water molecules, even a tiny snowflake, uh, 10 to the 15th to 10 to the 17th water molecules, incredibly large numbers. So when we detect one molecule at a time, it's uh, tr truly amazing to be able to do this in fact, it's one over Avogadro's number of moles, or 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24 moles, a very small number of moles. And in order to, to keep track of large negative exponents, scientists have created another prefix for 10 to the minus 24. So a yocto is 10 to the minus 24 yocto mole. So that's what one molecule is. Of course, it's a little silly to talk about a, a single object with these decimal points and so on. So we think it's a little bit better to have uh, to call one molecule one quaka mole, uh, which is really one over avocados number of moles. Okay, so uh, and I apologize to uh, Amadeo Avogadro here. Uh, this hopefully you could see that this is a joke. Uh, I'm, I'm we're making a little pun here. It's called uh, and uh, guacamole is of course a delicious food made out of avocados uh, that you may have seen in in, uh, in Mexican food cuisine. Uh, and uh, so, but in any case, uh, you know, as, as a little joke, we might call one molecule a guacamole. Okay, so uh, going back to the main point here, why do you want to study one molecule? And what would be the reason for studying one molecule? And, and by the way, in my group, we, we, we have a little mole from the American Chemical Society that you can purchase, but my students dressed up the mole here to, to recognize uh, this uh, guacamole here. Uh, so this would be guacamole here, and this would be a, a, uh, uh, a, a sort of some kind of a, of a drink or whatever. Enjoy. That's something like my laboratory mascot, if you, would, if, you, if you will. Anyway, my question that I posed, why do you want to study single molecules? So here's an analogy with baseball. Uh, so maybe you get a chance to play baseball or maybe not, maybe you play other games, but the idea applies to any sort of a situation like that. In 2004, the World Series champs were the Boston Red Sox. And so my student, Kelly Willits, and now she is, she is a full professor uh, at Temple University in, in Philadelphia. 
uh, she created this little uh, idea. Uh, so when you think about batting, hitting the baseball, uh, then uh, the different teams have team batting averages. And Boston had, you know, a pretty good team batting average uh, before this World Series. But it's worth the, it's, it's important to remember that this is an ensemble measurement. Uh, and so the ensemble measurement uh, has the, okay, well, my timer didn't actually didn't get started. So 15 minutes. Okay. Um, the ensemble measurement uh, is a uh, average over all members of the ensemble. So we call the, the team the ensemble. Um, but you also know that in, uh, you, you have information from each player. You can uh, calculate the batting average, uh, the probability of, of making a hit uh, for each player, and then create a histogram, we call it where you uh, plot the number of players as a function of different batting averages here. And, and this is a, a, a histogram. It's all, we also call it a distribution of the data. And you can see that there are a lot of uh, players bunched up here around 0.28 or so, uh, with some players going down to lower levels. But there's a special group of players down here almost near zero. Uh, so if you think about it for a minute, uh, you might realize that these players that uh, can't hit very well uh, those are the pitchers. So uh, by being able to in study the individuals, uh, you can observe the, a distribution and see interesting features in the distribution that would not be observable if you only had the ensemble measurement. So that's one of the main reasons for going to the single molecule level. We can translate this idea from baseball to molecules and ask, are the molecules, so, so to speak, marching to different drummers or, or not? Are they all the same? Or is there heterogeneity in the distribution? And quite often there is heterogeneity. Uh, now, the other thing that I would like to describe is how do we do this? How do we detect these single molecules uh, these days? So we're, we're using this idea of fluorescence. The molecules interact with light and emit uh, light at a different color. So to remind you how this works, uh, I'm drawing these little plots that uh, have energy going upward. Uh, and so this energy level is the unexcited molecule, the ground state. Um, the molecule can absorb a photon or a unit of light uh, from a laser beam and uh, become excited. So this next energy level is for the excited molecular state. Uh, and this energy spacing uh, is connected directly to the frequency or the wavelength of the light. So uh, this transition is called absorption, and the molecule is left excited. So fluorescence is the process, uh, after some relaxation, uh, of emission of light. That is, the excited molecule, after this first step, can e emit a photon of light. But because of the relaxation, the spacing between these energy levels is smaller, so that the wavelength is uh, longer, or the energy lower for the emitted photon. So there's uh, a, a shorter wavelength to pump and a longer wavelength to emit. And that's actually very helpful because uh, the pumping laser may be very, very bright, uh, but we, we want to detect these individual molecules that come from that one molecule. Uh, so we have to, uh, by having them separated in color, we, you can use filters uh, to block out the light from the pump. So uh, this is that same idea now with a little more detail. Uh, we pump to an excited state, and after relaxation, there can be emission in the lo to long wavelengths. We typically avoid intermediate states that might cause delays or problems. Uh, so there's, this is an image, then, of the light from a bunch of uh, single molecules. Uh, each of these spots is, uh, uh, is the light coming from a molecule. Uh, in a, a certain kind of detector. We'll, we'll talk about different kinds of, 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 of machines that can detect the light, but we, we call this uh, wide field and, and is one way of doing at it, looking at the whole sample at once. So here, here's uh, a schematic of the apparatus used to detect these molecules. A laser beam, let's say green or blue, pumps the molecule uh, and then the emitted light is collected. But let's step through this a little bit slowly. Uh, that green light is reflected off of a dichroic beam splitter, a beam splitter that reflects green but transmits longer wavelengths. Uh, a, a high quality objective is generally required to focus the light and collect the light. So that focus light can pump a molecule, uh, but this uh, objective or this lens can also collect the emitted light, which uh, 
then uh, proceeds in the reverse direction, uh, transmits here, and then filters can block out uh, any type of background signal so that the light on the, on the detector uh, will be from the single molecules only. So uh, this works uh, if, when you assure that only one molecule is pumped by the laser and that that molecule's emission dominates over all backgrounds. So signal uh, being optimized or maximized and low noise are all essential. So there's details about the apparatus, uh, but the important thing I'd like to just mention here is that this idea even works with your favorite optical detector, uh, your eyes. Your eyes built into your head, you have two of them uh, in the, mo the most cases. And this is, uh, it's easy to see the light from a single molecule now in our microscopes. Uh, there are very tiny points of light uh, that you can see looking inside the microscope. So your, your eyes are sufficiently sensitive to detect this light. And this is a major, one of the many reasons why you should protect your eyes, uh, never play with lasers and so on. Uh, and uh, rec just recognize that uh, these, these, ob these machines, which are connected directly to your brain, are incredibly sensitive, wonderful detectors as well. Okay, so that's how we optically detect single molecules. Uh, and it can be done in cells or polymers and crystals or even in solution. Uh, let's look at this a little bit more closely though, just to see the spatial scales involved. Our molecules uh, are either rhodamine dyes or cyanine dyes, or even these things called fluorescent proteins, green fluorescent proteins. Uh, in general, if you want to look at a, a protein that's not itself fluorescent, you, often you will attach the, the fluorescent molecule to the protein of interest. So imagine you've done that inside a cell and you have certain proteins that have these labels on them, we call them fluorescent labels. Uh, the laser beam is focused down to a small spot, but the spot cannot be made smaller than roughly half the wavelength. Note, remember that these uh, emitters, these molecules that are going to emit are on the order of a nanometer in size. Uh, they're very tiny compared to this focal spot. Um, but if you place them far enough apart, if you dilute the sample enough, then, then the light that's detected will only come from just one molecule. So uh, this is how that looks uh, for the case of a cell on a surface. A particular protein has been labeled. Uh, these are proteins of the immune system called MHC2 proteins. Uh, they have one of these cyanine dye labels attached to them. This, this one, like I've shown here, but a little bit longer in the middle, site five. Uh, and this protein uh, is uh, so fascinating to, to observe because now we can use this camera and the image of the sample to show you some amazing behavior. So here's what the camera sees and your eyes would see as well. A, an amazing dance a dance of these molecules on the surface of the cell. They're actually transmembrane proteins. They're in the membrane of the cell and you see them moving all around. Um, of, this is diffusion. This is the process driven by the temperature of the sample. This is room temperature sample here. You, in, this, in this old movie, which you, uh, so there are the edges of the cell and all of these dots are from single molecules, but the, the motion, uh, it depends upon what's in the membrane how much cholesterol is there. So there's fascinating science and uh, observation of these effects. You also see the molecules disappearing, turning off. Uh, now, what is that? That turns out to be photobleaching. That turns out to be when the fluorescent molecule has given so many photons that it finally is gonna give up, maybe change a bond or something like that. And uh, this process is the same as the process that you, you pay for when you buy blue jeans, but you pay someone to bleach them so that they're not blue, but they're white, not absorbing anymore. Uh, many, many molecules will photobleach ultimately, almost all. Uh, you also see them getting a little bit uh, larger in size in terms of the size of this spot. Uh, that's when the molecules are out at the edge of the cell and moving out of the focal plane of the microscope. So, so many things uh, present in, in this quite old movie. Uh, I, I, I like to show it again and again because uh, that's really interesting and fascinating behavior. Well, uh, watching motion is one thing that you can do, but measuring positions is another thing that you can do. So two different kinds of experiments are gonna be contrasted here in my discussion. But uh, the, the uh, uh, behavior 
uh, that I just showed you was motion, was molecules moving in the membrane. Uh, here's a, a surprise that occurred in our measurements. In 1997, uh, we were looking at uh, fluorescent proteins in bacterial cells. So this thing called the green fluorescent protein uh, can be attached to a specific bacterial protein. Here's a bunch of bacterial cells. They look like these little lozenges in this white light picture. Uh, here's the fluorescence from this same sample. And you see these dots, uh, and that's exactly what you would expect from individual copies of this fluorescent protein. But uh, note, in this experiment, now nothing is moving. Uh, these, these, mo these molecules are not moving around, but the, the video tells it all, tells you something amazing. We were stunned to see that the fluorescent proteins were blinking. They were turning on and off, blinking on and off inside the sample uh, at room temperature. So this less yellow fluorescent protein blinking and control uh, is something that at the time it was thought, oh, these molecules are not very stable. Maybe that's not so useful. Maybe that's not so interesting. Uh, but the, it, of course, as a scientific effect, this is fascinating. Why are they blinking? What's the, what are the reasons for it? And as a discovery, you can also be asking, what can I do with it? Which I'll show you in a few minutes. Uh, but this leads to the third signpost, uh, which is, when you're exploring a new regime of science, a new regime which had not really been observed before, you really cannot predict in advance all the wonderful surprises that may occur. So the surprises are, are just fantastic, wonderful. They can lead to unexpected and unplanned applications, of course. And uh, this is one of the reasons for exploring the nanoscale and exploring areas of science that uh, are not, uh, that have not been explored before. So a, a concept that I'd like to just now get across, uh, what I've showed you so far, being able to uh, detect single molecules, be able to observe them clearly, and this blinking uh, that I just showed you together uh, were used to achieve this thing called super resolution. Uh, and, so, and, uh, and so I will tell you more about how that works in, in just a few moments, but here's why super resolution is is really important. Lots of people uh, all over the world would like to observe the nanoscale molecular machinery that uh, uh, is, is present inside living cells or other complex systems. Here's a drawing uh, or a painting of a bacterium by Goodsell. Bacteria are pretty small, only a few microns in length, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, and filled, however, with interesting structures. How are we going to observe this, these very small objects? There's uh, cell walls, there's flagella, there's ribosomes, RNA, DNA, and so on. So you'd like to have methods that have the sufficient detail to observe very small structures, They're the nanoscale. Well, uh, to image them well, you want high sensitivity and specificity and the ability to image living cells at times, and you want very high spatial resolution. Now that's, remember I mentioned that at the beginning, because these objects are, are very close together, you, you need to have high spatial resolution. But suppose you wanted to do this with light. Here's the smallest possible visible laser spot that you can make compared uh, to the cell, okay, uh, on, on a same scale. If, in other words, if I try to focus a laser beam down to a small spot, it cannot be smaller if it's a visible laser beam uh, than roughly this size. So that's the, been the problem with optics for many, many years. You cannot uh, see very, very fine structure uh, without a special trick. So that's what super resolution allows us to do. And it was the reason for the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2014. Um, here is Eric Betzig over here and Stefan Hell and me. Uh, the king of uh, Sweden, uh, reward, awarding the prize for the development of super-resolved fluorescence microscopy. So uh, I'm going to tell you about that uh, and how it works now. Uh, but here's an illustration of why it tells you so much. That's the bacterial cell again. Some particular proteins have been labeled inside, and you can see the, the fluorescence, the emission from the cell. And you say, well, uh, I, all I have to, let's blow it up. It's too small here. I, I want to expand it so I can see the detail. 
Uh, so you might say, let's go buy the most expensive microscope possible uh, at that before super resolution. And you, unfortunately, even with the most expensive microscope, you cannot see the detail. And uh, the reason why is this, that uh, it, even though the emitters are just a few nanometers in size, they appear to be a few hundred nanometers in size in the microscope. The microscope records a spot that's fundamentally large uh, coming from diffraction. Uh, recognized by Ernst Abbe in 1873, the diffraction limit is lambda over two times the, the numerical aperture of the microscope. And the, the microscope's numerical aperture uh, is uh, on the order of one, so you can ignore that, roughly lambda over two, roughly wavelength over two. And this is this 200 to 300 nanometer number I've been talking about. Uh, even a point source of light looks in the microscope to be huge. And of course, this is a big part of the problem. So super resolution allows you to change this image that I'm showing you over here to that image. So a huge improvement if you have higher resolution, a huge improvement in the detail that you're able to observe. And that's what super resolution means. This is roughly five times beyond the diffraction limit, uh, which is a tremendous advance. It's not 10%, 15%, 50%, but easily achieved five, factors of five or even 10 in certain microscopes. So when you have much, much more resolution, you will see much, much more. You will see more things. So I hope at this point, you are really interested in learning really how this works. How are we able to use single molecules to do that? And here's the essential ingredients. First, we want to super localize the, the molecules. To explain this super localization concept, a little, a little uh, with, with an analogy, uh, this picture is, is one that I took up in uh, Oregon uh, at a uh, volcanic site uh, where there's a beautiful lake called Crater Lake. And in the middle of Crater Lake is a, we call it a cinder cone. So it's a little mountain that's left over inside the lake. Uh, left over from previous volcanic eruptions. Uh, here's uh, the cinder cone. Uh, uh, in all of our pictures, of course, we have to have a scale bar. So the, this scale bar is 120 times 10 to the ninth nanometers. <laughs> so um, that's a little bit you know, silly to use uh, nanometers for the size of that scale bar, but I think you understand the point. Uh, to find the position of this little mountain, all I have to do is to walk up to the top of the mountain and use a cell phone and read off the GPS coordinates, read off uh, the global positioning satellite coordinates of the position of the peak. So that's, that's what we mean by super localizing single molecules actually. Uh, in an image of a bacterial cell now with a 250 nanometer bar, uh, here's the uh, image of a single molecule turned into this little 3D picture because uh, what I'm doing is creating the third dimension from the brightness of the light from the molecule. So this is the same as those images I've shown before, except I'm using the third dimension to show the brightness of the molecule. And you see, it really does look like a little mountain. Its width is limited by diffraction to a few hundred nanometers, but finding the position of the peak is what we can do mathematically. We can take th that uh, data, which is the image of the light from the single molecule, and use mathematical functions to, to fit it with a function or uh, like a Gaussian function uh, to find the position of the center. And the beautiful fact is I can find the position uh, of the center with uh, a precision sigma that uh, scales as the Abe limit, the few hundred nanometer number divided by the square root of the number of photons detected. The more photons you detect, then the better you know the position of the molecule. So with a molecule that's sufficiently bright, let's say I got 10,000 photons, then I can go a factor of 100 below that diffraction limit down to a few nanometers in terms of my knowledge of the position of the molecule. That's super localization. And that's the first key concept. But this by itself only works for separated molecules, molecules that are far apart so that you can do this fitting. Uh, a uh, important, Additional effect is required to make this all work. 
uh, and I like to call it active control of how many molecules are on, how many are emitting, how many are producing light. This is achieved by choosing molecules or choosing situations where the molecules have two states. Uh, part of the time, they may be in an, a state that emits light. And uh, the other part of the time, uh, even though they're being pumped by a laser, they do not emit any light, sort of so-called an off state. So when you have a situation where there's on and off states, then you can solve the problem. I'll illustrate uh, and with another picture. Here's the structure you might want to look for, uh, and it, it uh, has details uh, it, and in this, let's say this 400 nanometers. Uh, so the idea is to place fluorescent labels all along the structure of interest. Here they're dark because the laser's off. Now what happens if I turn uh, all of the molecules on at the same time, then I see uh, these blobs uh, that correspond to those spots that I've been talking about, the two or 300 nanometer spots, this one up here, all of these spots are overlapping. And so you do not see the detail. And this is why the diffraction limit is a problem. But if I have this on off process, then I can solve the problem by simply actively controlling how many are on at any given time. I can force only a few to be on. Uh, by, for example, using the blinking process that I've already described, or photo activation, letting them be off, all off, and only turn on a few by a different control beam. Now I have individual separated spots, and I can find the positions of those spots. Uh, by these techniques I described, I write them down in the computer, uh, then let these molecules turn off, or even let them photo bleach, and then turn on a few more. So randomly, I will pick up uh, at, at the next time point or the next uh, frame of the movie, I can pick up different positions from different molecules and now record that where they are and do this again and again many times and then show all of the positions at once uh, by uh, you know, using the data that's in the computer to reconstruct the positions into one, we call it a reconstruction. And you can clearly see that there's uh, res super resolution detail, detailed beyond the diffraction limit. And, and that's basically how this works. This is super resolution microscopy or nanoscopy. So um, that's the key idea. That's how it works with single molecules. Now, um, just to make sure that the idea is completely clear in your mind, um, uh, let me give you another analogy so you can explain this to your family. Uh, or So to do this, think about fireflies. I hope everyone has heard about fireflies, these little, uh, organisms that uh, fly around and they, uh, they have light that they can emit uh, by a chemical reaction. Uh, and they also blink on and off, they turn on and off. So those are the key things to remember. And so now here's the analogy. So if you look at my hands on the picture, I'm gonna talk, tell you how to do this. Suppose you have uh, a tree and it's nighttime and you cannot see the branches of the tree. You can't see the branches. So to, to, and in order to see the branches then, uh, you need to place fireflies all along every branch of the tree. Place fireflies along the branches of the tree. And so you have all these fireflies lined up on the branches of the tree. And now you simply take a movie, okay, with your cell phone. And since the fireflies blink off and on, then there will be blink, 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 blink. And, and then in the frames of the, of the movie, you will see just a bunch of spots that appear random. But if you take all those spots and show them together at the same time, you'll see the branches of the tree. So this is uh, my firefly analogy. And it is, uh, uh, again, they're not moving in this analogy. Uh, you use that blinking to, to find out where the tree branches are. Um, hopefully that makes it clearer, but here let's do that with molecules now, illustrate the same idea with molecules. Uh, I have a cell here uh, where the, the microtubules, uh, which are uh, long segments uh, inside the cell, uh, they're tracks that, that molecules can move on. The individual tubulin molecules are labeled with a dye, a fluorescent dye. And this fluorescent dye is one of the dyes that, that will blink on and off when you shine light on it. So one frame of the movie just shows a bunch of spots, uh, which are the positions. 
uh, if you super localize them, you can uh, find their, their position very well. There's little white dots on the right side that you may not be able to see, but there are little white dots at every position of each molecule. The next frame of the movie, many, many more spots. And now there's uh, more spots added on the right, more spots from the next frame of the movie, more data and so forth. And if you uh, take a bunch of um, frames, a long movie and show all the positions, now you observe the microtubules inside the cell at high resolution, uh, much, much finer detail than is, was possible with, with diffraction limited imaging. So that's the, that's the idea. That's basically how this works. So uh, my, my signpost from this part, hopefully uh, you're follow, you've been following along, this super resolution fluorescence microscopy gives us a new window into the nanoscale, into shapes and structures beyond the diffraction limit. And the idea required fundamental scientific advances, being able to image single molecules, as well as the surprises that can occur when you look at a new regime, blinking and switching and so on, controlling the molecules. So hopefully you, you see how all of these things fit together to make this work. Okay, uh, now uh, in the years uh, since, in the last few decades, many researchers all over the world have been using these ideas to observe uh, new structures inside neurons, new behavior and structures uh, of the DNA inside our cells, cells, uh, fibrils that come from diseases like Huntington's disease, sugars on the surfaces of, of cancer cells. Uh, that's what, what all of these yellow uh, structures are coming from and they form tubules. Uh, the cell itself forms tubules and many, many others. It's, an, it's a very exciting time to be able to see much more detail. So my, my uh, signpost here, this type of imaging is an amazing new window into nanoscale structures, five to 10 times beyond the diffraction limit. We can understand cell biology better, catalysis materials, and we may uh, uh, find new strategies to affect pathogenic processes, amyloids, cancer, and we've even been applying uh, these uh, methods to the coronavirus imaging, the coronavirus infection of mammalian cells. Well, um, we have a 3D world. I've shown you mostly two-dimensional uh, images. There are optical methods to, to calculate and measure and produce three-dimensional images, but I'm going to skip this just because of time. Uh, and these 3D images can be produced. Here's a few examples. Uh, at, at, with using super resolution, using more optical methods. Uh, the, the reason I'm skipping all that is just to summarize and give you some final thoughts here. Uh, this area uh, now has impacted chemistry, physics, and biology. This ultimate limit of single molecules has attracted many, many people all over the world who continue to make important contributions, including in Ukraine, uh, and, and I know some uh, scientists there who, uh, and, and, and in fact, hoping to uh, hire uh, a, a Ukrainian uh, postdoc to come to my lab uh, in the future. Um, now, uh, a few more lessons, final lessons. Okay, so I'm getting to the end here. I think all of you have seen uh, the Nobel medal, which is up here in the upper right. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that many of you have, many of you have uh, seen only the front. The front of the medal has this uh, Alfred Nobel on it. What's on the back of the medal? What's on the other side? Well, on the other side of the science medals is this uh, fantastic uh, bit of sculpture. Uh, this is Natura, nature on the left, and Scientia, science on the right. Uh, and this uh, picture is showing nature holding a cornucopia, holding food and flowers and so forth for, for, for uh, humankind. Uh, and uh, science is lifting the veil off of nature. It's a truly beautiful and incredibly inspiring picture uh, that I hope will inspire you as well. Uh, but the important point is science is fun. Help lift the veil of nature if you're interested in science. Uh, you also need to find your passion. It's important to be passionate about your studies because, uh, and it's essential because it can be hard work. Uh, you need to be determined, persistent, and methodical. Uh, one of my other postdocs from uh, many years ago, a uh, Ukrainian uh, postdoc uh, named Oksana Ostroverkova came to my laboratory at IBM and we had a wonderful time studying uh, and at, uh, Stan at Stanford. Uh, uh, 
optics and light and so on. And she's now a professor uh, at Oregon State University here in the United States. Um, but you need to be asking how things work. Ask uh, how that cell phone really works. Uh, it's filled with chemistry, material science, physics, uh, electrical engineering, electronics, and so on. How does it really work? Uh, push beyond conventional wisdom. Question the assumptions. Uh, that's where you can find new science. Keep your eyes open for surprises. The surprises uh, may look like strange data. And you, you might say, oh, well, I'm going to throw that out. But if, if it repeats again and again, and you check everything, and you know that nothing is wrong in the apparatus, you may be onto a great discovery. You also have to embrace failure. This is truly important. During experiments at the, at the boundary of knowledge, it's not uh, possible to know everything that will, will happen. So some experiments will fail, and they failed in my uh, situations as well. Uh, you're marking up the wrong tree. You're not finding the right effect. You have the wrong apparatus. But that's actually an exciting part of learning. When, when something fails, that means part of your understanding about the problem is incomplete. So you need to think deeper about how to try to understand and measure and figure out uh, what part you don't quite understand, which uh, is a tremendous step forward, a very positive way to handle uh, failures. We do this because science provides this rational and predictive way to understand the world. And that's incredibly important. There may be a lot of irrational things going on, and none of us like those, none of us scientists like those irrational things that are going on. But if you, if you want to uh, improve the world and move forward, we have no choice but to use science to solve big problems. You cannot build a new bridge uh, without using science. You cannot cure a disease without uh, science. You cannot cure and, and uh, address climate change without using science and so on. So it's incredibly important and it, it stands against uh, the irrational parts of our world, uh, uh, but it's truly important to have it. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, you all in, enjoy it in some ways. If you happen to like science, if you don't happen to like science, there's many other fields of uh, art and others that are incredibly important as well. But we, we have no choice but to use science to solve big problems. So I'm gonna uh, thank my, my past students, my current students, uh, our uh, funding agencies. We have a little logo for no ensemble averaging. Uh, and I'm just reminding you why we call ourselves the guacamole team. So thanks very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer some questions. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you very much for a great lecture. It was a big pleasure for us uh, to listen to you today. Yeah, we have some questions. Um, we should start with, how do you think, are there any particles which are smaller than quarks? Do I think that there are any particles smaller than quarks? Really? <laughs> uh, very interesting question. Uh, so, you know, uh, when you get down to the, the scale of atoms and with their, with their neutrons and protons and so on, and then you realize that there are um, uh, quarks that comprise the neutrons, the protons, and so on, uh, and, and uh, basically at higher and higher energies, more structures have, have always been found. So uh, I, I don't think it's uh, so impossible that uh, even at even higher, higher energies, there, there may be structures uh, that could be found, and that partly because uh, the, the theories of the world based on quarks uh, alone and the, the standard model and so on uh, are not complete, not absolutely complete. And so there are parts of these theories that uh, might uh, get more well understood if there were, uh, you know, other particles found. But that's a question that is way out of my field. I'm not a particle physicist, uh, and I hope that uh, no one is insulted by my answer. All right, uh, let's go to another one. We can, uh, can we use electromagnetic waves with smaller waves lengths to increase resolution, not damaging cell structures? Okay, that's a wonderful question. Yes, you're correct that this uh, diffraction limit uh, gets smaller as you shorten the wavelength. Uh, the problem is, uh, once you, let, for example, move to the uh, ultraviolet, you break bonds. You destroy many types of uh, biological molecules, for example. So you, you can't really go to shorter wavelengths uh, to, without damaging and breaking bonds. Uh, inside, uh, inside many of the molecules that, that form the essential molecules and cells. Um, so 
Uh, it's also true that you can uh, go to other types of particles. You can go to uh, electron microscopes, which have a, a very short wavelength, of, um, and uh, de Broglie wavelength, it's called, uh, and you can get even higher resolution images. However, in electron microscopy, uh, the microscope image is uh, a grayscale image. That is, it's, it's uh, bright and dark, and it's, it does have lots of detail, but you cannot easily figure out which protein is which, uh, unless those proteins are in a line and form a microtubule or something like that, or form a cell wall, you can, you can recognize those certainly. But uh, there's thousands of proteins that do not, uh, are not discernible or recognizable uh, in electron microscopy. And this is a challenge that the field is working on. Uh, there, some are pushing to higher resolution, but uh, we're trying to help solve this problem by labeling structures inside those cells, and then putting the electron microscope image together with the single molecule fluorescence. Now we can say that this particular blob inside an electron microscope image is a particular protein, or at least right next to the label that we are detecting by these techniques. So we can use this uh, optical technique to uh, improve uh, another method, electron microscopy, and, and help uh, see uh, objects or identify objects uh, on, on shorter spatial scales. Okay, thank you. Next one, could there be errors in M imaging because of molecules, which are not localized in one point, but in several points due to the quantum effects? Well, uh, so in, in these systems that I've been uh, discussing, uh, okay, biological systems, uh, let's say at room temperature or body temperature and, and so on, uh, it's, it's extremely rare for there to be superpositions uh, where uh, the effects that you're talking about from quantum mechanics uh, are important. In other words, uh, the, the molecules and everything, of course, uh, obey uh, uh, the uh, uncertainty principle and things like that. Uh, but the uncertainty principle really applies to when there's, you're trying to measure two parameters at once. So if you're not measuring the momentum, you can measure the position uh, precisely uh, up to limits that I've really been describing. Most of these limits I'm describing coming from photons and uh, Poisson statistics and things like that. Uh, those are essentially coming from uh, light and electromagnetic waves uh, that are, can mostly, mostly be described classically with semi-classical analysis. Now, um, it's, it's true and very exciting these days that uh, with uh, entanglement and things like that, you can uh, do uh, fascinating new experiments, but that's a, a totally new area and uh, is only just beginning to get the slightest bit started. Uh, there are no images uh, using those kinds of uh, fundamental quantum me mechanical effects uh, you know, uh, that look like the detail of the images that I've already shown you. So that's a challenge for the future. All right. Thank you very much for, uh, for your lecture. Uh, you have answered all of the common uh, questions we usually have in this lectures in your last slides. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to uh, see you today, to listen to uh, you today. It was an extremely interesting lecture. I hope that everything will be fine soon and even we can meet and do in-person lecture in here at Peaceful Key. Thank you. I have, uh, I have hopes that uh, everything will improve uh, soon as well. And uh, we, we think about uh, you and your country uh, every day and, and hope for those improvements uh, as soon as possible. Uh, yes, I've, I've, uh, it will be exciting to uh, speak in person sometime, somewhere. But thank you very much for your listening. And uh, I'm glad that we can uh, do this uh, and, and discuss at least and present this information uh, in this remote way. Thank you very much, too. Good luck to all of you with, with all of your work, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay, bye-bye.